Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Morconin, and today we're discussing the U.S. debt clock. There's been a lot of confusion around U.S. debt, how much it matters, how much I as an individual should care about how much debt the U.S. holds, how that affects inflation, how it affects the prices of things that I want to purchase. So I wanted to do an episode today where we just lay out the facts of how much debt the U.S. has, how fast that debt is growing, and what the various options are that the U.S. has to repay the debt and to reach some level of financial stability. And at the end, we'll get into the worst case scenario, the best case scenario, and the most likely future scenario. There's a really great website you can go to called usdebtclock.org, where you can see the total amount of debt as it's being accumulated in real time. So you can see here that the U.S. currently has $29 trillion in total debt. And each year, the U.S. collects about $4 trillion in tax revenue, but it spends about $7 trillion in spending. So that gives us a budget deficit of about $3 trillion per year. And Elon Musk recently tweeted about this, which got quite a lot of attention on Twitter, where he tweeted, quote, U.S. national debt is $29 trillion or $229,000 per taxpayer. Even if we taxed all billionaires at 100%, this would only make a small dent in the total debt the U.S. holds. So obviously the rest must come from the general public. That is basic math. Spending is the real problem. So Elon also points out that the federal debt to GDP ratio was only 56% in the year 2000. Now it's 126% and climbing fast. So why does this matter? Why should we care about the debt to GDP ratio for the United States? Well, we can see that the total amount of public debt has increased quite drastically, and especially once the pandemic hit, it's now been increasing at an even faster rate than it was before. Gross domestic product, GDP, basically the amount of economic output the U.S. has each year, has been increasing, but it dropped significantly in the 2020 pandemic, and it has been increasing since then, but not nearly as fast as the amount of debt we're accumulating. So therefore, the debt to GDP ratio has increased sharply since the 2020 pandemic. It was, like Elon said, only about 50% in the year 2000. Now it's at 125% in the year 2021. On top of that, we have this deficit, this $3 trillion hole each year that's being added to the total debt burden. So it's not like things are just bad now, but they're getting better. They're bad now and they're getting worse each year. So why does this matter? Why should I care about this huge national debt that the U.S. holds? Well, let's imagine the U.S. as a household. That might be easier to visualize. So imagine if you're a household and you earn $210,000 per year in income but you're also indebted $290,000. That's not a great situation. And it's an even worse situation when you consider that each year you're going deeper and deeper into the red. So yeah, you might make $215,000 next year, but then you're going to be $300,000 in debt, and then $400,000 in debt, and then $500,000 in debt. This is not the type of financial situation you want to have as a household, nor is it the type of situation you want to have as a country. And this is one of the reasons why there have been fewer and fewer countries and corporations willing to buy U.S. debt because the U.S. has not been seen as a very responsible financial actor recently. And another thing worth noting is that many economists see 130% debt to GDP ratio as the point of no return meaning there's only been one case in history where a country has gone above 130% debt to GDP and has still survived, and that is Japan. The U.S. hit 130% debt to GDP during the pandemic, but if we hit it again, that may be the true point of no return, and we'll have to see what would happen if we get above that level in the future. Jack Dorsey also tweeted about hyperinflation, which is quite related to this debt to GDP ratio. And he tweeted, quote, hyperinflation is going to change everything. It's happening. And a lot of people were snarky about Jack's tweet. And they said, oh, well, is it really hyperinflation? Technically, it has to be 50% inflation month over month. We haven't had that yet. But I think people that get into the technical definitions are missing the point. Because even if you have inflation of 10% a year or 20% a year, that is 
probably going to become runaway inflation, meaning eventually the currency will be totally worthless. So whether we have the technical definition of 50% month over month hyperinflation, or whether it's simply a double digit runaway inflation scenario, I don't think it matters much one way or the other. Jack is pointing to the fact that we are pretty much at the point of no return. And it's also something that's worth noting is that Jack is the CEO of Square in addition to being the CEO of Twitter. And so he has a lot of information at his disposal about how much different companies are spending, how much they're charging customers at all those point of sale Square card readers. And so he has a lot of data that the average person does not have access to. And when we look at how hyperinflation is actually affecting regular people, there are some very obvious examples. So one is the price of food. Global food prices have been skyrocketing since the last several years. And this obviously is something everyone has to spend money on, no matter how wealthy or, or poor you are, you have to spend money on food. And when we look at other commodities, we've seen massive increases. So heating oil up 128%, gasoline up 123%. So lots of energy is up almost doubled or, or more than doubled in the last year. And then you look at coffee, aluminum, cotton, copper, a lot of commodities are up about 50% year over year. Uh, same thing with corn, wheat, soybeans. So we are seeing massive increases in the basic things that households spend money on. We're also seeing the median sales price for homes go up pretty significantly in the last few years. So just to compare, around the year 2010, we had a median home price of around $200,000, $240,000. Now the median home price is around $400,000. So we had about a, a doubling of the U.S. home price in just the last decade. That, that is pretty extreme. So to just summarize, our situation right now as it relates to pricing and inflation is stocks are at all-time highs, home prices are at all-time highs, Crypto market caps are at all time highs, wages are at all time highs, job openings are at all time highs, and inflation is the highest in 30 years. And at the same time, while this is occurring, the federal government is saying we need to hold interest rates at about 0%, which obviously fuels inflation. So this brings us to the question, what is the U.S. doing? Why doesn't the U.S either tighten their amount of spending so that we don't have this debt each year growing in size with the deficit? And also, why doesn't the U.S. just simply increase interest rates so that we don't have such rampant spending that increases prices for regular people? Well, there's really three options the U.S. has regarding this amount of debt. The first option is a hard default. This would be simply saying, hey, we're not going to pay any any of our, our debt. We know you guys thought we were going to pay you back, but we're just not going to pay you back anymore. So anyone who holds treasury bills, for instance, they're not going to get their interest payments that they receive every quarter, every month, or every year. Uh, foreign countries that hold U.S. debt, they're not going to get paid back. Regular Americans uh, who hold U.S. debt, they're not going to get paid back. This is never going to happen because this would be the end of the U.S. economy as we know it. So we know for sure this is just not an option that the U.S. is even really considering at this point. The second option regarding U.S. debt is austerity measures. We saw this in Greece. We've seen this in other countries in Eastern Europe in the past. And this would be tightening spending relative to revenue so that we actually start to operate at a net profit rather than a net loss. And so you can imagine maybe we cut military spending, maybe we cut some Medicare, Medicaid, maybe we cut some other areas of spending and we keep revenue the same or maybe we even raise taxes so that we end up at least digging ourselves out of the hole a little bit year over year. Unfortunately, this is political suicide in any democracy. So any politician who proposes to increase taxes and to cut social security or cut military spending is very quickly going to find themselves out of a job. And in any democracy, typically what happens is you might have austerity measures for a few months or maybe a few years in the second term of a president, for instance, but then you're going to have a changing of the guard and the new politicians that are voted into power are not going to support these austerity measures. And so they're going to reverse. So while austerity may seem like the most common sense 
solution for the U.S. in regards to debt. And certainly if you're a household and you had this amount of debt, this would be the most common sense solution. It's just not feasible with the current political situation. The third option is a soft default, which is printing lots of money to devalue the currency so it's easier to pay back debts. And this is actually what's happening right now. So if you think about it, if you own a million dollars, but then you can just print a million dollars, well then that's easy. You just print a million dollars, you give the new million dollars to the person who you're in debt to, and then you've paid back your debt. And that's fine in, in regards to just you and the person you're indebted to. But with everyone else who holds dollars in the world, now their dollars are worth less. And so this is really a way to devalue the currency without having some drastic collapse that's going to happen overnight. And you can see how the U.S. really is keeping interest rates almost at zero. We ticked them up a little bit to about 2% in 2019, um, but they were at zero before then, after the 2008 crisis, and now they're at zero again after the 2020 pandemic. You can also see the interest payments that the U.S. has to make just on the debt, so without even starting to pay back the principal of the debt that the U.S. owes on that $29 trillion, just the amount of interest we have to pay each quarter is about $500 million. So even just paying back the interest is quite a, quite a burden on the U.S. And so this brings me to a point that I think is really important for anyone to know, especially if you are very critical of the Fed and the way the government is handling things, and that is that the U.S. is currently stuck between Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla and Charybdis is from the Odyssey, from Homer's epic poem about Odysseus coming back from the Trojan War to his homeland in Ithaca. And as he's going through the Strait of Messina, there is a really dangerous situation that he has to navigate. And that is that if he goes towards the whirlpool, Charybdis, every person on board his ship will die. Odysseus will die, none of his men will make it home, and that will be total destruction for he and his crew. Whereas if he goes towards Scylla, the seven-headed serpent monster, the monster will eat probably half of his men, but at least his ship will make it through and he won't be totally destroyed. This is the situation the U.S. is in right now in regards to the national debt. And one question you might have, and I had this question, is why doesn't the U.S. just raise interest rates? If you raise interest rates, there won't be so much unnecessary spending and therefore prices won't increase as a fast of a rate. In other words, we won't have as high of inflation if we raise interest rates. Well, the reason that we're not raising interest rates is because we would have to pay so much as a country just to service the interest on the debt if interest rates go up. So imagine right now, if we increased interest rates by 1%, if we increase interest rates by 1%, just to service the interest on the national debt would be more than we pay for Medicaid. It'd be more than $500 million per quarter. And if we raised interest rates by 2%, that would be more than the U.S. spends on Medicare, just to service the interest on the debt. And if the U.S. raised interest rates to 3%, it would be even more that we'd spend to service the interest on the debt than both the defense budget and Social Security retirement. So we really are caught between Scylla and Charybdis. And I would say Charybdis, the whirlpool that kills everyone, is raising interest rates because that would collapse the U.S. economy. Whereas Scylla is inflating away the value of the U.S. dollar. So that's what the U.S. has decided to do. And when we look at the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, we can see it's gone pretty much close to zero. So I think it's an interesting question to ask yourself. If you were in charge of the U.S. government and the Federal Reserve, what would you do regarding the U.S. debt? Would you increase interest rates, which would increase the amount that you'd have to pay to service just the interest on the debt, and it would also lower economic activity. There'd be, there'd be less people willing to spend money in the economy, so GDP may fall as a result, and that could lead to a runaway collapse of the total U.S. economic momentum. Or would you choose Scylla, and would you continue to inflate away the U.S. dollar so that it's easier to pay back debts, you're not doing anything too drastic, but somewhat gradually, everyone who holds U.S. dollars is losing purchasing power. Which would you choose? Now, this brings us to the future scenarios. Let's start with the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario.
The worst case scenario is something that the World Economic Forum posted on social media in 2015, which is, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy by the year 2030. And this is something that I'm very concerned about when you think about what are the macro trends driving us toward. And the basic idea is that right now the U.S. is printing a ton of money. They're devaluing the currency and they're buying assets with that money. They're buying treasury bills. They're buying mortgage-backed securities. And in other words, they're pumping those asset prices. They're pumping the stock market. They're pumping housing prices. Uh, Indirectly, they're pumping crypto prices. And now the U.S. is attempting to tax unrealized capital gains on those assets. So if you're someone who's trying to have a safe haven from inflation, and so you hold assets, well, now the U.S. government is trying to tax the gains, unrealized gains on those assets, uh, which I would consider legalized theft. And so this is the worst case, is that you have BlackRock buying up all these single family homes, so home ownership becomes pretty unattainable for most people. You also have big tech companies merging with big government so that we have mass surveillance uh, top down and there's, there's not as much bottom up uh, power to the people. And so this worst case outcome would be something like you don't prepare, you don't really worry about inflation, you don't really worry too much about investing in Bitcoin or other assets to hedge against inflation. But instead, you wake up one day and you see that your purchasing power has been destroyed. You still have the same amount of dollars in your bank account. But this is no longer enough to pay for food, energy, and housing, which are the three biggest areas that have been affected by inflation and the three biggest line items in any household budget. So this would trigger a great reset, which the U.S. government is already preparing for. Every U.S. citizen would get some sort of central bank digital currency wallet, which basically cuts out the bank middlemen. So you have an account directly with the Federal Reserve. And then there would be some form of universal basic income for good citizens. So we already saw this in the 2020 pandemic where they gave out $1,200 stimulus checks. This could be something that's given out not only as a one-time payment, but on a monthly basis. And I think one dystopian scenario is that it's only given out to citizens that are seen as being good citizens, meaning they don't speak out against the government, they pay their bills on time, they don't invest in crypto that's not... Uh, approved by the U.S. government. And so this would be a full way to surveil citizens and control all their financial activity, where you could halt someone's ability to pay for goods. Maybe you could even turn off their access to the internet by having all internet providers sort of needing permission from the U.S. government. And so this would be similar to what the Chinese Communist Party has already implemented in China with their social credit score. And essentially, they can turn off any Chinese citizen's ability to engage with the economy. Now let's talk about the best case scenario. Best case scenario. The best case scenario is that as hyperinflation goes parabolic, so does hyper Bitcoinization. So in other words, as the purchasing power of the dollar approaches zero, the purchasing power of a Bitcoin approaches infinity. And so there would be a push and a pull, and this would allow for some stability and even an improvement in the underlying system as the transition takes hold. And because the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, I think it's quite likely that the US dollar will be the last fiat currency standing. Uh, Therefore, even if the US is pretty late to the game in regards to adopting Bitcoin as legal tender and really promoting Bitcoin among U.S. citizens, the U.S. still has a serious competitive advantage over other nations that do not hold the world's reserve currency. So as long as the U.S. eventually embraces Bitcoin, it will adopt the Bitcoin standard and it will be in a much better position than the vast majority of sovereign nations because we have a much greater ability to spend to invest in bringing about that Bitcoin standard. So, for instance, when El Salvador introduced the Bitcoin standard for their citizens, they gave every El Salvador citizen $30 worth of Bitcoin in the Chivo wallet that El Salvador government created. So you can imagine if the U.S. did this, they could have their own U.S. wallet that every citizen can download. And then probably even more than $30 worth of Bitcoin would be given out to citizens. It might be something like $300 worth of Bitcoin per month for the first six months or 12 months or maybe even an ongoing system. So I think the U.S. is in a pretty good position right now as long as we eventually 
embrace Bitcoin. And also because Bitcoin is priced in U.S. dollars, there is an argument that Bitcoin will help the U.S. dollar to survive beyond the fiat standard. And it will be in a pretty strong position uh, relative to other fiat currencies, even after the Bitcoin standard has taken hold across the world. So I think both systems will keep each other in check. The Bitcoin system will prevent the total collapse of the U.S. and the global economy, as it will be a safe haven for any investor that wants to maintain and even grow their purchasing power over the next 10 years. And the fiat system will also prevent the total collapse of more old school investors and people who aren't as tech savvy, they're not as into the crypto space, and so therefore they might otherwise get totally left behind. If you're a late adopter and you're not the type of person who's ever going to buy Bitcoin, no matter how much it makes sense to do so, it's nice to know that the fiat system, the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve are looking out for you in some regard. So I've heard before that the Fed is trying to save grandma. You know, Gary Gensler wants to save grandma from having all of her purchasing power destroyed. So that may be why they've slow rolled the total adoption of Bitcoin. If tomorrow the U.S. announced we are adopting the Bitcoin standard and we're fully embracing Bitcoin, dollars are, are old news. Well, then every country in the world that holds dollars as their main currency, which is many countries, would all of a sudden be in crisis mode and they would try to get Bitcoin as quickly as they could and there would be absolute chaos. So I can see why Gary Gensler, the SEC, the Federal Reserve are slow rolling the adoption of Bitcoin because they don't want to do anything too drastic uh, unless they absolutely have to, both for their own careers and for the stability of the macro economy. Now let's talk about something that Luke tweeted. He's one of my favorite uh, Bitcoin personalities on Twitter. And he tweeted this awesome chart that shows the devaluation of the dollar combined with the price growth of Bitcoin. And it's kind of amazing that we have this perfect on-ramp to financial stability at the very moment when we need it. So I, I really cannot thank Satoshi enough for creating the Bitcoin white paper, which happened about 13 years ago, almost exactly. And I want to just post this one video real quick about hyper-Bitcoinization that I saw. Good morning. Happy Monday. Here's 60 seconds on hyper-Bitcoinization. Every single Monday that some people wake up thinking about sats and some people wake up thinking about fiat currency is the process of hyper-Bitcoinization. Every single Monday, there's more people than last Monday waking up thinking about the new currency and working for the new currency this week compared to last week. That is the process of hyper-Bitcoinization. The apps are already here to stop using fiat or significantly reduce the amount of fiat that you're using. We already have the transitionary checking accounts, already have the transitionary savings accounts, already have the transitionary retirement investing accounts. There's people that are waking up this morning, heading off to their jobs, getting on their computers, thinking about a different currency than the one they grew up on, that is hyper-Bitcoinization. It's happening right now, today, and the apps are available today for you to stop using fiat or using fiat less. Now let's bring it home with the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. The most likely scenario in my mind is that the U.S. government is not going to do anything drastic until they must. That means they're not going to implement austerity measures. They're not going to taper interest rates. They're not going to ban Bitcoin. And they're not going to totally embrace Bitcoin as legal tender until they have to, until there's some trigger where doing nothing is seen as more dangerous than doing something. Therefore, the U.S. is going to continue its soft default by printing lots of money while also keeping interest rates low. In other words, the U.S. is still is going to navigate between Scylla and Charybdis to avoid any drastic crisis. But eventually, Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point will be reached and everyone will use Bitcoin. And this is something that's really easy to understand in hindsight, but it's hard to understand while it's happening. And if you look back to smartphones, for example, there was a time when no one had smartphones and then almost instantly everyone had smartphones. You probably don't even remember this transition because it happened so quickly. Same thing from no one using the internet to everyone using the internet or no one using email to everyone using email. We are going to see, I believe sometime in the next six months, maybe 12 months at the most, 
from almost no one using Bitcoin to everyone using Bitcoin as their primary medium of saving purchasing power. And the question is, what will the trigger for this tri tipping point be? In my mind, there's two different triggers that could happen. One is a trigger where there is a crisis and either it's a major market crash. So you could imagine if the stock market crashes, if the housing market crashes, or if there's a hyperinflation event, like everyone increases their prices, prices drastically all at once. This would be a situation where you, quote, don't want to let a good crisis go to waste. So if there were some major economic crash and people did not have the ability to pay for what they need to on a day-to-day -day basis, this is when there would be some either embracing of Bitcoin or introduction of a central bank digital currency. This is when some major trigger would effectuate some major change. Another tipping point could be FOMO. So even if there's not a major crash in the economy, there could be another country that decides, hey, we're going to be the first country to make a major move on Bitcoin. El Salvador already made a move, but we are Canada or we are France or we are Japan, and we're going to aggressively start buying Bitcoin so that we're in a better position once the Bitcoin standard becomes realized. This could trigger FOMO in the United States, and this could result in the Fed aggressively buying Bitcoin and embracing Bitcoin as the new foundation of the economy. So my final word of advice on the U.S. debt clock is to simply be aware of it. Don't be someone who only thinks about debt and inflation once it's already reached the point of no return. It's important to prepare for these events beforehand. And the best way to prepare for inflation is to buy Bitcoin. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin. You can just buy 1,000 sats, 10,000 sats, 100,000 sats. At Bitcoin's current prices, $150 or 0.00243157 Bitcoin gets you your mathematical share of Bitcoin if it were evenly distributed among the world. So basically, if you own just 0.01 Bitcoin, you will be wealthy compared to the rest of the world. We're going to talk about what Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future. Present.